And today I want to share with you reason number 777 why I have chosen to not watch The Chosen. I know, I know, you probably love The Chosen. You probably rave about it. Maybe you get together with your friends and you do watch parties, you know? what? I don't know, listen, I'm not here to judge you, but I'm going to share with you the reasons why I have chosen, for me and for my family, for me and for my house, we have chosen not to watch The Chosen. And I saw something yesterday that triggered me again. Now, some of you, I mean... You, maybe you've been hanging out with me for a while now, for the past few years, and you probably know most of my reasons already. If not, I will share them with you here in a moment. But something new happened yesterday that triggered me even further, and I want to share that with you now. So when I was on scrolling on Facebook, yeah, I know it's Lent. I, I got it. You know, a lot of people have abandoned Facebook or social media for Lent, and that's, that's amazing. Praise be to God. Unfortunately for me, it's part of my job. So I was scrolling through Facebook yesterday and uh, someone had tagged me in a post that was linked up to the chosen Facebook page. Okay, so I take a look and the post says, qu I'm quoting you here. Okay, this is somebody at the organization who manages the chosen's Facebook page. I have no idea who this is. I'm in no way suggesting this is Dallas Jenkins, the, the director, producer, or or is it Jonathan? R no, I don't. I doubt it's any of them. It's just somebody else. I have no idea who, but this is what they said. Quote, here's the bad news. Your religion, your church, the law, your efforts to be righteous won't save you. Here's the good news. You don't need your religion, your church, the law, or your efforts to to be righteous, to be saved, close quote. Now, the picture of the post is of the character of Jesus, played by Jonathan Rumi. And there is a quote on top of the picture. And that quote says, quote, If you do not realize that you need a year of the Lord's favor, I cannot save you, close quote. Now, I don't have an issue with the, the image or the quote on the image. I don't have an issue with that at all whatsoever. But... This whatever whoever typed in this other stuff, I take big, big issue with. Here's the bad news. I'm going to repeat it to you just so you can see this. Here's the bad news. Your religion, your church, the law, your efforts to be righteous won't save you. Here's the good news. You don't need your religion, your church, the law, or your efforts to be righteous or, or, or your efforts to be righteous, to be saved, close quote. Now, why would that be a bad thing? This is an old argument. It gets uh, warmed over fairly frequently about, uh, you know, the, we don't need religion. We're, re we're spiritual, right? We have a relationship with Jesus, not a religion. But that doesn't pass the smell test on a number of levels. And I thought, I would, uh, I thought I'd discuss that with you today. So this is my reason number 777 why I have chosen not to watch The Chosen. It is because rejection of religion is a rejection of what is right, good, and true. A rejection of religion is a rejection of God himself. How can I say that? Well... Last night, I decided that I would, uh, you know, look some stuff up. I, I had some my, my own opinions of this type of thing. But last night, I looked it up in the, what you know, what is the definition of religion? Well, Thomas Aquinas has a definition of religion in his Secunda Secunda. And, uh, you know, I double-dog dare you to argue with Thomas Aquinas, the greatest teacher in the history of the church, says the virtue which prompts man to render to God the worship and reverence that is his by right. Religion may thus be defined, according to the Catholic Encyclopedia, religion may thus be defined as the voluntary subjugation of oneself to God, that is, to the free supernatural being or beings, on whom man is conscious of being dependent, of whose powerful help he feels the need, in whom he recognizes the source of his perfection and happiness. St. Augustine would say, we are tied to God and bound to him by the bond of piety. He says that is the definition of religion. I think we can summarize all of that, Augustine, Aquinas, or what have you, as it is the virtue of justice. We give to those what is owed to them. 
if I owe you money, I uh, then I must give it to you. I owe you a decent show every day, so I have to work hard, get up very early in the morning, and do stay up late at night doing my research, doing my homework, trying to get the kinds of guests that I think are going to be good to provide insight into the complexities of life in this world to give you what is owed to you. You deserve a great program, and the team at the Station Across is working to provide that to you. It is just, it is right, it is good, it is true that we do that. It is a virtue. Well, how much more then do we owe it to God to give our very selves to him? We give him ourselves privately and we give ourselves to him, say it, say it with me, publicly. And what is that public part? That is called worship. I wonder, golly gee whiz, do you think possibly, is there any chance that God might have an opinion of what that worship looks like? Hmm. Or is it just left to you and the Holy Ghost? Hmm. I don't think so. There is, in fact, there is, in fact, a pattern, we might say. We might say that there's a pattern that we could follow. I mean, you don't have to be a biblical scholar. You don't have to have gone to seminary or the Moody Bible College or any other place that you like to come to these patterns very quickly. What did we see in sacred scripture? Just go very go right back to the very beginning. There is a pattern of how worship works. Even with Noah, Noah was given a very clear set of rules and guidelines to offer sacrifices, to have some animals that were considered clean and some animals that weren't. Some animals that were set aside for sacrifice and worship. Even Abraham was told, given very specific instructions on how to execute an, an offering unto God, a covenant to create a covenant relationship with God through sacrifice. We see that same thing going all the way to Moses, who was commanded through the burning bush to go back to Egypt, no matter his stuttering problem that he claimed that he had, a little ploy to get out of it because he didn't want to go. But nonetheless, go to Egypt and save my people, he was told. And he went. Finally, Aaron helped him out, and they confronted uh, the Pharaoh, and they had a war with the gods of Egypt And guess who won? I'll give you three guesses and the first two won't count. That's right. God the Father did. God, yes, yes, you are correct. The only one true God destroyed these fake gods of the Egyptian peoples by the plagues. Yes, that each plague was a plague on a Egyptian God. What's the message being sent? There is only one God. And him alone shall you worship. And they shall go three days journey to the mountain. And there they shall render worship. They shall render unto God what is right, good, and true. And what did they do when they get there? I mean, go look it up, Exodus 24. Moses takes 12 priests, sets them on 12 pillars, and they offer 12 sacrifices. And Moses collects the blood from the 12 sacrifices, combines them all together, and on the main altar, all facing liturgically east together, Facing the rising of the sun, meeting God at the rising of the sun, there Moses sprinkles the blood on the altar, and then he turns and sprinkles it on the people, and they share in the blood of the covenant. Now they are one. God the Father and his people are family now because they share the blood. What happens after that? Oh, yeah, it gets better. They go up the mountain, and there they enjoy a vision of a meal together. Woof, man, who goes up there? Moses and his inner three. Moses, his inner three, the 12, the 72. Seems to be a pattern there. I'm starting to notice these patterns of sacrifice, of liturgy. Okay, well, go read Leviticus. All commanded by God. All of it. Every bit, last you know, syllable commanded by God. God was very intentional Okay, the golden calf did change things. I agree with you. I see where you're going with that. Yeah, that's true. They didn't start that way. They ended that way because of the stiffness of their neck, the hardness of their heart, and their rejection of God, the Father as God the only. And they turned their hearts back to those pagan idols of Egypt. And so after the golden calf, they got the plan B instead of the plan A. Nonetheless, all of it dictated by whom? By God.
God dictated every last syllable of all of it. Every effort to build the tabernacle, to to worship God, all of it. And then he inspires David to even further organize them into choirs, 24 choirs, which we see in the book of Chronicles, to set up liturgical music, the Psalms, all of it commanded by God. Even Solomon continues this down the line, keeping the same patterns, by the way. We see these same patterns move forward into the life of Jesus. By the way, Jesus, one of the most religious, I would say the most religious character in in all of Scripture, old or new, you're going to find Jesus is the most. Guess what? He kept the law perfectly. He had, He went to every single feast in Jerusalem that he was commanded to go to or he was supposed to go to as an Israelite male. He went to them all. Every Passover, every Sabbath day, he kept the law perfectly, never missing once. By the way, so did his mother. Guess what? Without the stain of sin, not even venial sin. Yes, I'm tempted to smash like a, a like a chocolate bar right right now. I could if it was in front of me or a cheeseburger. Man, I would go to town. I would need those things, but I'd want them because of my concupiscent nature. Not the blessed mother. Uh uh-uh. uh. She is not going to be tempted by a one pound bag of peanut chocolate covered M and M's like I do. Okay, she's not going to have that problem, but I do. She doesn't have that problem because she is no original sin. She is no stain of sin. She resisted all temptations, unlike me who gives into them at a moment's notice. She doesn't have that problem. And yet she gave herself over to the rite of purification 40 days after the birth of her one and only son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. So not only was Jesus keeping the law perfectly, but so was his mother. And we see the pattern because go look in the book of Revelation. It is smells and bells nonstop, 24-7. So God has an opinion of worship. God has an opinion of how we live our life. And God is owed our worship and our adoration. 